हेलो Is there a staff member here? Hello. Hi. Hi, my name's Celia. Hi, Celia. Thanks for being on time. <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> so we'll start um, after twelve, right? Correct. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, and just a reminder, I'll just be here to keep an eye on on the chat and anything, or if you have any questions, just to let me know. Um, so I'll be listening in. Uh, generally speaking, uh, within at the end of each hour i will probably have a, about 10 minute of break um, okay. and then we'll start in the next hour okay sounds yeah. good okay thank you
Hello, everyone. Um, so we are probably going to wait for a, a one or two minutes for um, others to join. Uh, hopefully, within uh, next couple of minutes, we will start. And I'm just pasting in the chat box the website based on which the um, uh, workshop um, that I will be uh, presenting here. Uh, that all of the tutorial materials are in this website. Uh, feel free to check out this website. Uh, we'll wait. We wait for another one or two minutes. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, so I am the presenter of this workshop today. Um, and uh, just to introduce myself, I am Ehsan Karim. I'm an assistant professor at the School of Population and Public Health at the University of British Columbia. Um, in terms of my research by training, I'm a statistician and I have done some research about the high dimensional propensity scores. And that is basically the origin of uh, today's workshop. Uh, so for those, for now I see we already have more than 30 participants. And in, in the chat box, I'm again um, giving you the link for the website based on which I will be presenting the materials for this workshop. Um, you should be able to see the uh, materials in this website. Um, just before I begin, um, can anyone confirm whether they can see the screen um, where I'm showing this website? Uh, and you can respond it in the chat box. Okay, thank you, Eva. Thank you. Uh, thank you for confirming. So in this workshop, um, we will be talking about high dimensional propensity score. And in terms of this high dimensional propensity score, um, we are going to talk about um, some of the implementation guidelines of this high dimensional propensity score. Uh, and we will be using an open data source uh, so that others can also replicate some of the uh, implementations that I'm going to show here. Um, this workshop is not going to explain uh, the R coding um, of all of the tiny details, uh, but the workshop is more designed towards explaining all of the logics that are uh, necessary to understand why this high dimensional propensity score algorithm is uh, useful and how to implement it using existing software packages uh, so that the general idea is that once you go through this workshop, you will be able to understand the rationale of using high dimensional propensity score. And uh, you will also have some understanding of how regular propensity score is different than the high dimensional propensity score. And then we will move on to some of the exciting 
extensions of this high dimensional propensity risk score towards these uh, machine learning as well as double robust um, estimates um, that can enhance the high dimensional propensity score uh, analysis to some extent. And of course, we will have uh, some discussion about the advantages and, and limitations and controversies about this high dimensional propensity score. And we will also talk about uh, some of the reporting guidelines uh, when you are using this high dimensional propensity score in an analysis and you are planning on presenting it to a manuscript, what are the things that you are supposed to present or write in that um, manuscript, all right? So in terms of the workshop prerequisite, obviously uh, we are expecting that you have basic understanding of R and basic uh, regression um, understanding. Um, and, and in terms of the codes, obviously this is a website that was created based on Quarto. So you, you are supposed to see the course as well as the outcomes. Um, and then you can see uh, the analysis. So, okay, let me try to understand. So in terms of the chat, uh, you are basically seeing the outline. Okay, let, oh, I understand what, what is happening. So let me stop sharing and let me share again uh, with the screen. In this screen, can you, can anyone confirm they can see the website? Okay, okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you for uh, letting me know. Uh, otherwise I would just uh, show this uh, website um, <laughs> just show the desk, desktop instead of this website. Uh, thank you. So this is the website that I have been showing and, and for those who have joined a bit late, I am pasting the web, website's link one more time in the chat box so that you can also follow along uh, the website that um, I am showing here. All right, so I was basically describing the purpose of this workshop. Um, I'm going to explain the implementation guidelines as well as the difference between high dimensional propensity score and propensity score, and then the rationale of the some of the extensions in the machine learning and double robust version. And then I will talk about some of the advantage and limitations. Um, in terms of citation, if you think this is uh, something that is useful and you want to cite it somewhere, there is a citation available here for this. And if you have any question about this workshop, uh, some additional clarification that you need, feel free to communicate with me after this workshop. Um, and I will be happy to uh, talk about uh, and receive comments uh, from you. All right. So with that in mind, let us begin. And, and in terms of the logistics of this workshop, um, you, are, uh, you do not need to run any codes. Um, all of the codes are uh, as well as the outputs are available within this website. And in this web website, uh, you can uh, see um, some of the citations as well uh, as some of the text that are available that might be helpful for you even after this workshop. Um, and uh, in terms of this particular workshop, uh, just so that we can understand the concept, I'm using one particular research question um, that is uh, going to be our motivating example for this particular workshop. Uh, and, and this uh, particular question is, does obesity increase the risk of developing diabetes? And this is the question that we will be uh, trying to explain using one of the open data sources. And this is a question that is based on some of the literature that is already out there. Uh, so in terms of a research question, this is not necessarily a new research question, and that is not necessarily the objective of this workshop. In this particular workshop, I'm basically using this question as a motivating example so that I can show you how to implement high dimensional propensity score algorithm around this question. One of the... Um, one of the 
other thing about this particular question is that um, obesity is not necessarily the best exposure variable uh, because sometimes it is very hard to define obesity uh, in terms of not in terms of measurement but in terms of for how long you have this um, obesity and, and this is true for many other uh, exposures like this um, and, and Again, I want to remind you that uh, defining a question or how to define a well-defined question is not necessarily the objective of this workshop. We are basically using this question as a motivating example so that we can try to uh, show the implementation. So uh, finding the causal inference around this question is not necessarily our objective here. So to answer this particular question, say for example, we want to understand does obesity increase the risk of developing diabetes? We want to look at some data source based on which we can analyze uh, the data to get some answers. And within the US context to analyze the data, we are basically using a open data source that anybody can go to the website uh, and download. And that data source uh, that we are using here is the enhanced data source. Um, and this means the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. And this is a data source that has been collected by the um, US government and by the US CDC. Uh, and uh, they have provided these data sources um, in the internet. Anybody can just go in the CDC website and can download this data source. And there is even an R package that can help download the data source if you exactly know from which component and which variables you want for your analysis. You just need to have a very good understanding of the uh, data dictionary. So in terms of this particular data, if you just go to the CDC website, you can see there is a data for 2013 and 14, and similarly, they also have the data source from 2015, 16, um, as well as 2017, 18. And this is an open data source, uh, and anybody can just go to the, say, for example, demographic data, and they can uh, look at the data dictionary just by looking at the demo underscore h uh, uh, doc, and this h is associated with the year. Uh, see, for example, for 2015 and 16, when you go to the demographic data, you see there is this I, demo I, and when you go to the enhanced 17, 18 data, and you go to the demographic, you see demo J, right? So in each year, so these subscripts are associated with the years uh, for which the data was collected. So in terms of the, data dictionary, you can simply go to this doc file and you can see all of the different variables that are being collected within the data source. And if you want to know more about uh, the particular variables, say for example, country of birth, if you just click on it, you can see uh, what are the categories um, they were uh, based on which they, are, they were collecting the information. Um, and there were a lot of information uh, that is available out there that you can utilize in your analysis. One particular point I want to emphasize here is that this particular data source is a complex survey data. This is not a simple random sampling. And because this is a complex survey, they also give you some information about the sampling weights or the interview weights, as well as some of the uh, variance calculating uh, variables, such as the strata and cluster variables that are necessary to properly conduct the analysis. But again, for the purposes of our analysis so that we are not over complicating the concepts, we are basically going to use the data as it is uh, so that we can basically show uh, if you have access to a data source, how to utilize that data to analyze the uh, high dimensional propensity score, all right? Uh, the other uh, aspect of this particular data source is that this data source uh, is an observational data source. And what that means that we obviously need to think about the confounders in this analysis. Um, and if you look at the literature, 
and you are if you are basically interested about exposure uh, being obese as well as the outcome of developing the diabetes you can look for many many co-vidators and uh, confounders um, that needs to be addressed so for example in here you can see education family history of diabetes uh, smoking status and such and such so there are many confounders you can identify in the literature that you need to adjust to get a proper estimate of uh, the effect of exposure on the outcome, right? The way in the enhanced data source, the way it works is that if we go back to the enhanced website one more time, so this is the demographic component that you are looking at in here. And if you go back, you can see there are many other different components that are also available. So there are not only uh, demographic, but also dietary information, examination data, laboratory data, uh, and there are some ad additional data sources, uh, such as the limited access data source that you need to um, understand uh, to obtain all of the different variables uh, that are available in different parts of the data. So just to give you a bit more understanding about enhanced so for example for enhanced 2013 and 14 there is one component of demographic and in that demographic component you can get the information about age sex education race or ethnicity marital status and so on you have if you want information about obesity that information is not available in the demographic you need to go to a different component for that and it is called the body measures component and from there you get the information about the exposure there is another component about diabetes and from that component you get the information about whether the patient is diabetic or not as well as their family history of diabetes and then for say for example other providers such as smoking you need to go to other different component of smoking and cigarette use uh, and similarly, you can have you, you have to get the diet information from diet and behavior and nutrition component, physical activities from physical activity component. So there are, because the data source is so large, they have split the data into many different pieces or components. Uh, and if you look at each of these components, there is, say, for example, I'm going to the demographic data one more time. And there is a variable called SCQN, and this is basically the ID information that is available in each of these components. So that even if the data is stored in a way that are in different data sources, because you have the unique ID number, based on that unique ID number, you can basically merge all of these data sources into one data source uh, and create your analytic data in that way. Right, so remember we were talking about three different uh, data cycles. So we were talking about 2013, 14, 15, 16, and 17, 18. And in here, we are basically only talking about 13, 14 um, because all of these other data sources also have the same pattern. So you have to go to this particular component to get this information about a particular variable. And once you get all of the information about all of these different years, and then you can merge all of this information from different years as well. Uh, so there are multi-layer involved in, in accumulating this data. Uh, and if you want to know more about how to do that, there is an appendix that I have included at the very end of this workshop material. And you can see um, there I talk about different designs, usefulness and different cycles. And if you want to, get the reproducible codes of how to download this data. There is a package in R called Enhance A. And in that particular package, you can basically specify which particular data from which years. Remember, H was associated with uh, 2013 and 14 cycle. And you can basically specify from which year you want to get the data and then you can specify which particular variables you want to download. And how would you know what are the name of the variables? You basically go to the data dictionary or, and you can find out all of the names of all of these uh, variables that you need to do your analysis, right? So say for example, in here from the demographic component, we're getting information about age, gender, education level, race, ethnicity, and so on. 
And similarly, from, from BMI component, we are getting information about uh, the BMI from the diabetic component. We're getting the information about diabetes and smoking, diet, physical activity, and so on. Um, there are other variables such as sleep, and there are other components that are coming from the lab components and that we are including in our data source. And once we have all of these different components, we can basically merge them based on the ID variable. Remember, we talked about an ID variable that is associated with each particular patient, and this is an unique ID. So even if the inf information is sparse in different data components, you can basically merge them together using this unique ID. And you can do the same thing for the second cycle from the 15, 16, and you can also, and, and the structure is very similar. All I need to, need, needed to do is to change this uh, subscript that was associated with this 15, 16 cycle. And all of the variable names are usually the same, but you need to check one more time using the data dictionary whether uh, the names remain the same. And you can basically uh, reproduce all of the codes to get the uh, 2015, 16 data. Same thing is happening for the 2017, 18. I'm basically changing the subscript to specify which particular cycles data I want. And then uh, all of the, most of these variables remain the same. Sometimes they change some of these variable names, such as this in this um, data uh, for the sleep cycle, uh, they change the variable names from the previous. So I, I needed to go back and, and check what, uh, what, what was the new name that they were using and, and after, collecting all of this data, I basically merge all of this data to create the 17 data. Um, and after merging, one of the things that you need to do is recording the data because sometimes um, the variables would be associated with some particular category uh, that you do not need. Say for example, for age variable, they have a um, continuous variable. If you want to convert that to a categorical variable, you need to specify which categories you want. For the sex variable, for the education variable, what are the categories that you need? Say, for example, if they have uh, eight different categories, do you really need all of these eight different categories or do you need to merge them uh, together so that you do not have any problem of small cell sites? Uh, some, some of this consideration uh, that you need to do your analysis, you need to take into account here uh, so that you categorize the data properly. Um, also, you need to think about what are the eligibility criteria that you need to impose on your study. Say, for example, in our study, we impose the eligibility criteria of uh, age has to be at least 20, as well as uh, we want to work with the people uh, who, who are not pregnant at the time when we are collecting the data, right? So we imposed all of these criteria in our, so this is happening for the 2000, 13-14 uh, data, and this is happening for the 15-16 cycle. Um, same recording. Uh, you just do the same thing uh, three times because you are dealing with three different cycles. Um, and, and after you deal with all of this recording, you basically uh, merge all of these data sources uh, to get the uh, entire uh, population that you want to analyze. Of course, there are additional consideration that you need to take into account, such as how many variables are missing uh, and stuff like that. Specifically, in our data, we were dealing with a number of lab variables. And in the lab variables, sometimes uh, there are uh, missing components uh, uh, or missing values. Uh, in a realistic analysis, if we, if we were doing um, an analysis where um, we want to uh, do some causal inference and we were interested about finding the clinical implication, we would probably need to think about uh, these missing values uh, a bit more. But for our analysis, uh, we basically need a data to analyze. And that's why we did not overcomplicate our, our analysis with this missing data analysis. So what we did is we basically uh, considered a complete case analysis. Um, and based on that complete case analysis, we created the data. So the reason I spent some time in explaining the enhanced data is because I'm going to use this data to show you the implementation of high-dimensional propensity score. Um, and 
if we um, understand the data that that will help us understand some of these um, implementation details. So I have a question that I see in the chat box. In that question, it says, uh, for any SQN, the information in the related data structures are single rows per patient case, or there are multiple rows per patient, uh, for example, for laboratory measures. So generally speaking, for most of the components, uh, this is single row information that we are collecting. But there are, however, some situations where we might have multi-row observations, such as this proxy information that I'm going to introduce a bit later. For that, we have some multiple row information there. But other than this proxy or this ICD-10 codes, all of the other different components that you have seen, these are basically single row information. There are some exceptions, however. So, so for example, for the um, systolic blood pressure or the diastolic blood pressure, sometimes some of these measures, if you do it just once, there are some uh, measurement error considerations. So for those measurements, what they do is that they take multiple uh, measurements of these um, diastolic blood pressure and systolic blood pressure. Uh, and in the literature, you will see, sometimes they do a, an average to get just one value out of all of these different measurements that they get. Uh, so to answer this particular question directly, it depends on which type of variables you are talking about. Sometimes for lab variables, there might be multiple observations. Sometimes for the proxy information or the ICD-19 code, there might be multiple observations. But in this particular analysis, what we are doing, we are um, analyzing all of this information and making it a single row. And how we do it for the proxy information is something that I'm going to explain later. All right. Okay. So now that we understand a bit more about the data, and now it will make sense. So this, say for example, this this structure that you are seeing, um, we we are getting these variables from this component, and then there are different components, and we are merging all of these components, right? So this is something that we basically do, uh, and uh, this uh, table represents what we I have already shown in the picture. So this DIQ component is giving you the information about diabetes, BMX component is giving you information about the BMI, and there are some demographic uh, components, and there are some behavioral variables that are also coming from different components. There are some health history and access information that are also coming from different components. And also there are some lab information that are coming from at least three different components um, that are giving us all of these different uh, lab components. Yes, sometimes it is possible that you have multi-measurements, but you need to figure out how do you, do you want to use those information? Do you want to combine them into one uh, value or do you want to use those repeated information? Depends on the aim of the study. In this particular study, I have basically uh, used one information and not repeated information uh, specifically for these variables. So in this variable list, what you are basically seeing is that I have 14 different uh, demographic behavioral health history related variables. And most of the, these variables are categorical variables, either binary variable or, or some sort of categorical variables. Um, and uh, there are some lab measurements that I have included in this data analysis. And these lab measurements are basically mostly continuous. Um, and that is why uh, we will see later how we deal with this analysis uh, because we 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 only have 25 variables here, right? And to do any kind of causal inference, obviously, uh, what we generally do is we go to the literature and we try to identify all of these confounders uh, so that we get a, we we can adjust for these variables in the analysis, right? But sometimes what happens is that specifically when you are using secondary information, as an analyst, you do not have a control over which information should be collected because these informations were basically collected by the US government to make different policies about different things that they were interested about. But you are particularly interested about the association between obesity and diabetes, and you want to understand this particular question, right? And for this particular question, you went to the literature and found out some of these confounders. 
but it, it is highly possible that there might be some confounders that you cannot directly measure from the data source that you are using. Say, for example, in this particular example, I am showing a variable such, uh, known as comorbidity status that is identified as a confounder in the literature. Uh, but if you look at the enhanced data source, there is uh, there are no direct way of measuring it. Um, if you are familiar with the comorbidity indices, such as this Charlson comorbidity index or the Alex Hauser comorbidity index or the chronic disease score index, some of these variables that are necessary, um, those variables might not be, um, are, are not available in the enhance. And that is why it is sometimes not possible for us to uh, create these comorbidity variables and, and that will remain an unmeasured confounder in this analysis. So one question that I have received in the chat box was that, how can we know the temporality of enhanced given it's cross-sectional in nature? Uh, would that affect the DAG? Uh, so this is a very interesting question in the context that we, when we are doing an analysis, specifically when we are doing an analysis using the cross-sectional data, we need to have a very good understanding of how the variables were measured and when they were measured, right? Uh, say, for example, in some of these questions, uh, when they are measured, say, for example, when they uh, measure, uh, when they ask a question about a particular disease, um, say, for example, uh, did you have cancer? Sometimes they also have this question, at what age your doctor told you that you have cancer, right? And if you, if you are lucky, you might be able to get those questions about the uh, time component, like when did you know that you have cancer or some other particular disease? And based on that time component, you might set a restriction on your data analysis of um, the temporality. So for example, if your exposure was some variable and your outcome is some variable, you can set a restriction based on those time variables whether your exposure was happening before the outcome or your exposure was happening actually after, after the outcome, which you need to delete from your data, right? For this particular situation, when we are talking about obesity and when we are talking about uh, whether a, a patient was diabetic or not, we cannot establish that type of temporality. And that is what uh, basically this question in the chat is asking, is that if we cannot, uh, determine the temporality, how can we uh, make the causal inference? Remember, or that uh, determination of the temporality. But remember at the very beginning of the uh, workshop, I told you is that this is basically an example study where I'm showing you if we had this data and if we had this DAG, um, then how would we uh, implement the high dimensional propensity score? So in this data source, since we are not able to make the determination of the temporality. Obviously, we cannot make a strong claim about the causal inference because we cannot basically talk about temporality. So that's basic, and that is why we are not going to make any clinical conclusion about that. Um, and yeah, that's okay. Uh, and so let's just move on. So that is an interesting question, by the way. And this is something that you also need to understand whenever you are reading any paper based on the enhanced in the literature, um, that causal inference part cannot be really established unless you have some uh, specific questions about temporality in the study. Okay, so of course we have talked about some confounders and then we are talking about some other variables that are probably not uh, something that is in the enhanced data or the data source that you are analyzing. So those are basically unmeasured confounders, right? And if you have an unmeasured confounder, what are the epidemiologic ways to deal with this kind of unmeasured confounders. So one practical technique that people generally use is called uh, using proxy. And, and this is a, a picture from a van der Waal paper from the European Journal of Epidemiology from 2019. And in this paper, they talked about the modified disjunctive cost criterion. 
And in the modified disjunctive cross criterion, one of the things that they mentioned that what are the variables you need to adjust? Obviously, the variables that are associated with the exposure variable. So A is an exposure variable and Y is an outcome variable. So a variable that is associated with exposure variable and outcome variable should be adjusted. Um, if you know there is an instrumental variable that should not be adjusted. And if, if there are good proxies of unmeasured confounder or the unmeasured common causes, uh, we can also try to adjust for it. Uh, say, for example, in this particular DAG, you can see U is an unmeasured confounder, but C1 is something that is measured, right? So according to this modified disjunctive cost criterion, we should be adjusting for this uh, C1 variable when we are adjusting for the, uh, trying to understand the impact of A on Y, all right? So in this particular situation, so we if we are basically talking about adjusting for proxy variable, what are the proxy variables that are available in the enhanced data that would help us understand the comorbidity status? So that's where uh, this additional information about ICD-19 codes are, are relevant. And let me explain a bit how these informations are collected. So during the interview status, what happens is that an interviewer asks the participants in the last 30 days, what are the medications you have taken? And interview, interviewee basically lists some uh, medications that they were taking in the last 30 days. And then the what the interviewer does is they convert that information into the ICD-910 code. For those who are not familiar with the ICD-910 code, um, this is an international uh, system of recording the information about the uh, classification of different diseases. A and based on those information, uh, we, we basically record those ICD-19 codes in our health administrative data sources. Uh, and say, for example, if you uh, find a code of A49.9, that basically means there is some sort of bacterial infection, right? Um, if there is some sort of code of uh, C61.P, that means that uh, some sort of prostate cancer uh, related medication this particular patient is taking. So these ICD-910 codes are there in the enhanced data source as well. If you go to the enhanced data source, you can basically see a lot of ICD-910 codes are available. And if you want to know more about the ICD-19 course, you can see a long list of ICD-19 course that are available in the uh, ICD, the RxQ component of the enhanced data. And that basically gives you a very good understanding of what type of medications these patients were uh, taking in the last 30 days uh, before the survey, right? And, and from this, you, you get some understanding of what are the other diseases these patients have and that could be helpful for us to understand uh, about the comorbidity status of these patients, right? So if you are thinking of uh, addressing your unmeasured confounding using some of this proxy information that you have available in the enhanced data source, you might be able to use some of this ICD-910 codes to get some information about your unmeasured confounder. One thing I should note here is that even though you are using an unmeasured confounder to adjust for your analysis, this would reduce your bias. But the problem with the proxy information is that sometimes it will, uh, like the direction of the adjustment is not necessarily obvious when you are adjusting um, for a proxy variable, right? It could be in the uh, on the right of your null or the left of your null and, and that is something you need to be able to understand uh, if you have some subject area knowledge. But just from the analysis, it is very hard to understand um, in which direction this is helpful. Uh, why it is helpful is that even though you do not necessarily know the exact direction of the correction, um, overall proxy adjustment is going to be helpful in reducing bias. And that's where Sometimes the epidemiologists and the statisticians differ a bit because the statisticians are more interested about unbiased estimates 
where the epidemiologists are more interested about reducing the amount of bias. And that's why they, uh, they think that adjusting for confounding is reducing their uh, amount of bias and, and they are happy with that type of analogy. All right, so I have explained you the data source, the enhanced data source, and I have explained you why somebody would be interested in adjusting for proxy information, right? And, and historically what happened is that when you have information in the data, even though we are dealing with massive amount of information, so for example, if you are using enhanced data, enhanced actually includes a lot of information about partic a particular patient, but epidemiologist or the statistician, what we generally do, we do we all only want to restrict our analysis to the variables that are identified in the literature or that is identified either by some sort of DAG or identified by some sort of uh, variable selection criterion, right? We are usually not comfortable adjusting for everything, whether we can interpret it or not, right? So that's not something that we generally do. We only want to adjust for variables that we understand are impacting our analysis in some way. Uh, so for example, it, it might be a risk factor of the outcome. It might be a confounder. Uh, and we also stay away from some of the variables such as the instrumental variables or the mediation variables, right? That's where this high dimensional propensity score algorithm is slightly different from our uh, general understanding of epidemiology or the implementation of uh, different methods in different data sources. And to give you a background about this high dimensional propensity score, uh, you can see this is a paper that was published in 2009 uh, in the Epidemiology Journal. And over the years, this is gaining more and more popularity every year. Um, even in 2023, you can see there are uh, uh, some people who are uh, still citing this paper. Um, and the key idea that um, this paper gave, the Sneeweiss paper gave, is that we basically need to have some proxy variables. And we also have access to a lot of these ICD-19 ports. And specifically, their implementation was more about the administrative data. And because the administrative data are usually not open, that's why we are using the enhanced data. But in both of these data sources, we have information available about the additional proxy information, right? And one of the argument of this Nevis paper was that even though we do not know in interpretation about a lot of this ICD-19 course or this proxy information, those proxy information might still be helpful in our analysis. And what was their logic? Their logic was that uh, some of these ICD-19 cores or the comorbidities that we are seeing in the patients are actually helpful in our understanding of the health status of that person. Say, for example, here, you can see there is a uh, CPT-4 core. So this is not ICD-9 uh, ICD or 10 core. This is a, a different classification system where this is a CPT code about uh, the um, that are usually collected in the hospital. And this code, uh, say for example, if someone was using a oxygen canister, uh, that means that that person is of very, very frail health. A regular or healthy person does not necessarily take a oxygen canister in the hospital, right? So what Sneeweiss was suggesting is that when a patient is taking something like this, you obviously know that patient is with frail health. Or if you get some, uh, some of these cores that are associated with the regular, uh, regular checkup visits or some uh, uh, to see their um, family doctors, then you know that this person is uh, compliant. If a person's ICD code is every, every year there, that they went to their family doctor to discuss their health, you know that this is a, a compliant person who is very conscious about their health. And that also gives us some information about that person's uh, understanding or, or the state of their health. Um, so what Sneeweiss was suggesting in that paper is, is that we should not throw away the useful information, that some of the information that, that can be useful in our analysis to understand that person's health status, right? So even though we, in our analysis, say for example, when we are analyzing 
the relationship between the obesity and risk of developing diabetes, that has nothing to do with whether somebody used oxygen canister or not. But still, oxygen canister, use of oxygen canister or someone was going to uh, regularly to the doctor for regular annual checkup and stuff like that, those type of information are still helpful for us in understanding the general status of their health and those information can, can be helpful. But the problem is we have huge amount of information, huge amount of such information in the data source. And if you are using thousands of this information that you cannot really interpret, that can overpower uh, some of the information that you already have identified as a confounders, and you might get some bizarre results, right? So one of the things that this uh, high dimensional propensity score algorithm does is that it tries to identify uh, some selected number of proxy information that are going to be useful for the particular analysis. And then it does not use the full information. It only uses some of the information that are empirically identified as uh, uh, as useful information and how they select that is something that I'm going to explain uh, when I'm going to explain about the high dimensional propensity score steps. So you can see there are uh, different steps involved in the high dimensional propensity score. And by following those steps, they try to identify which of these codes are going to be helpful for the analysis. So one thing to notice here is that there are two types of variables we are basically talking about here. One type of variable, if we go back to our previous slide, you can see these are the variables that were already identified by the subject area experts that these are the variables that are helpful for our analysis, right? So these are called investigator specified covariates. And then we also have additional information and these are proxy information. These are not investigator specified covariates. So these are something that we are also going to use in the use in the high dimensional propensity score, uh, and we will see how to uh, select the useful number of covariates from this uh, huge amount of information using this high dimensional propensity score algorithm. So again, there were two type of variable. One was the investigator specific covariates, and one were uh, the list of covariates that are commonly known as the empirical covariates or the recurrent covariates in the high dimensional propensity score uh, literature. Okay. So that brings us to our um, data analysis. And this will, uh, in, in our data analysis, when we implemented all of our restrictions such as 20 year or old, not pregnant, and we only restrict our analysis to those who had information about some sort of uh, proxy information about uh, the use of medications in the last 30 days and so on. So this is the data source we are going to use. And after merging all of these data sources from different uh, components and merging all of the uh, information from different subjects that adhere to these restrictions, we obtain more than 7,000 patients. And we are going to use these 7,000 patients to show you the implementation of high dimensional propensity score. Um, Okay, so at this point, um, let us take about 10 minute break and then we'll come back. And after that break, we'll talk about this high dimensional propensity score. In the chat box, I have a uh, question about the website uh, for this material. And you can see these materials uh, in this particular website that I'm pasting in the chat box. It, feel free to ask any question within these next 10 minutes or so, uh, or take a break. And then after that 10 minute, we can come back and discuss more about the steps that we need to take about the high dimensional propensity score. All right, thank you.
Hello everyone. Um, we can try to start now. So I see there is a question. Participants between years are all different or the same participants might be included in different enhanced cycles. Um, okay, so yeah, I think the way the enhance works is that they take uh, complex survey in different years and the patients are usually not the same. Uh, so in that case, uh, we, we can consider all of these patients as independent subjects when we are collecting information from different cycles. Um, and, and that is why the concern about the uh, independence of the observations is not usually uh, something that we worry about. Uh, and this is not a longitudinal study that we are uh, relaying on the same patients over the years. Um, I hope that makes sense. Okay, so, okay, thank you. So in this particular study um, or, or, or the steps of propensity score analysis, what we have done is that uh, according to our eligibility criteria, we have obtained uh, 7,585 uh, subjects. And obviously we can try to run a propensity score model uh, on this um, particular patients. And what would be the confounders that would, we would be selecting in a regular propensity score? In a regular propensity score, we would be basically using the investigator-specified covariates. Remember, we talked about 25 investigator-specified covariates where 14 of them came from demographic behavioral access information and uh, 11 of them were coming from lab information. So in a regular propensity score analysis, we would be using only those information in our propensity score model, right? But in this workshop, we are going to talk about how to incorporate the proxy information so that we can build a high dimensional propensity score. Okay, so in terms of the proxy information, um, the way we obtained it is that remember, we at the very beginning of the workshop, we talked about merging the three cycles. And when we merged the three cycles, we basically merged all of these three cycles and uh, created a data set. And we also created a complete case data set for the investigator specified covariates only, right? Uh, we then also talked about uh, the proxy information or the ICD 910 codes that were available in these three different cycles. And we uh, merged them into, uh, so we, we merged them together to create a data set of proxy information. So there are two different parts of the data that we are talking about. The part one of the data was the complete case data with all of the investigator specified covariates. And the second part of the data is basically the information that we got from the proxy information, right? So let us talk about the uh, investigator specified uh, covid part of the data. So this is a data that was built based on the, the complete case analysis and the proxy information is something uh, that we have created based on the information that we have obtained from the last 30 days. And this is something that is very important to understand about the proxy information is that even though we might have, say for example, when we are dealing with health administrative data sources, say for example, the data source that is collecting information about the hospitalization or, or going to the doctors or the emergency visits, in those type of scenarios, the information is collected on a longitudinal basis. So if a patient is um, enrolled into the study, uh, just because that patient is enrolled into the study does not necessarily mean that that patient does not go to uh, the doctors anymore. They still go to the doctors, they still go to uh, different type of diagnosis, uh, but in a high dimensional propensity score algorithm, what we generally do is that we try to restrict the information of this proxy information. Uh, specifically in terms of the timeline. We do not take any information that was collected after the exposure. So all of this proxy information that we are collecting uh, comes from before the exposure. In our enhanced data analysis, this was aut almost automatic because uh, the proxy information was coming from the last 30 days. Um, uh, so 
um, we, we know that uh, they were coming before the um, BMI measurements, right? So in that way, we have made sure that the proxy information is not uh, after the exposure. Um, and this is something that is known as the coveted assessment period in the high dimensional proxy risk score terminology. When you are using the health administrative data sources, usually this coveted assessment period can go back to six month or one year or two year. But mostly you have seen in the most of the analysis, it will be six months. Uh, and, and you can play with it uh, if you think that the type of observation that you are dealing with or the type of outcome that you are dealing with only six month observation of the proxy information before the exposure is not enough. You can obviously extend it to one year or two year. And then uh, that also makes sure that none of the information that you are collecting are longitudinal or happening post baseline, right? And that is something that is very important because like if you are dealing with some sort of post baseline information, um, then uh, you may not have, uh, you, you may not be able to uh, confirm whether this is either a mediator or a confounder, right? Okay. So in, in the part two of the data or the proxy information, there is something else that you also need to consider. Uh, and that is, uh, you need to be a bit careful about which type of variables you are letting in in the analysis. Because if you are including some information that are highly associated or the, sorry, if you are including some uh, proxy information of your own exposure or own outcomes, obviously they would be considered highly associated with the outcome sometime, right? And th that is something that you do not want. Also, if you know some of the drugs uh, or the information that are going to act as an instrumental variable, those are the variables that you do not want to include as a proxy information either. Uh, similarly, if you think that there are some uh, proxy information of some investigator specific coverage that you have already included in your investigator specified covariate list, do not include those information in your proxy information list. Otherwise you might get some information that are duplicated. You already have a covariate and you already have additional proxy information that is uh, directly related to that covariate. Uh, and that will create some uh, problem in terms of the multicollinearity and whatnot. And same thing goes for the exposure and outcome. So in this case, what you are seeing that there are some ICD cores that are highly associated with the uh, diabetes, right? They are di directly associated with diabetes and there are some uh, one ICD code that is directly associated with the obesity or the overweight information. And this is our exposure and these are highly associated with our diabetes or the outcome variable, right? So these are the information that we do not want to include in our analysis. Um, right, so I have a question in the chat box and it says that um, we initially had 30,000 information, but we are only working with uh, more than 7,000 patients here. Uh, and that that is because we restricted our analysis to the ones um, that only have proxy information uh, because not all patients reported that they were using medication in the last 30 days. And for the sake of our high dimensional propensity score analysis, we are not including their information in our data. So that restricted our analysis to 35,000, sorry, uh, 7,000 uh, patients only, not the 30,000 participants that we originally had uh, in our entire population. Does that clarify? So that, that was one of the questions from the chat box. Anyway, so we, we try to be a bit careful. So obviously we are trying to include a lot of the information that are available in the proxy information, uh, but those information needs to be uh, sorted a bit uh, in terms of whether they are proxy of outcome, whether they are proxy of exposure, or whether they are proxy of some of the covariates that are already included in the analysis, right? If that is the case, uh, then we can include the variables that we do not think are problematic in our analysis and we can try to see what those variables look like. Say for example, for your understanding what I have done, I have printed the information from 
one particular patient that was associated with this particular ID, 100001. This is the ID of one particular patient, the SCQN number. And then I tried to see uh, what are the ICD-10 codes that were available for that particular uh, person. And I see there is a three-digit code of F33. That means that there's a major depressive symptom. There was another code of I-10 that is a uh, ICD code for uh, hypertension. Uh, and, and so on. So this is all coming from only one patient. So remember at the very beginning, there was a question about whether there, there are multiple information coming from or multi-row information that are coming from these patients or not. For most of the variables that we have dealt with before, no. For some of the lab variables, we had multi-row information, but we have condensed them into one row, uh, either by taking average or some other means. But for these proxy information, as you can see, these are multi-row information because like for this same patient, you have multiple uh, uh, observations that you are receiving from this patient because these are patients that are taking major depressive order uh, symptoms, uh, medication also taking the uh, medication for hypertension and heartburn and so on, right? So these are the multi-row information that are coming from the same patient. And uh, what we try to do then is that we try to merge these, these proxy information with the original complete case analysis information. And that is where we are reducing our uh, number of uh, subjects from 30,000 to uh, 7,000 here, right? And, and that creates our data source based on which we are going to analyze our data, right? Uh, so in this particular step, and this is the step one, and in this particular step, what we have basically done is that we have identified the proxy data source. And in our case, our proxy data source was the medication data source that are available in the enhanced data. If you are using some sort of administrative data sources, it is possible that you have uh, one dimension coming from hospital, another dimension coming from the emergency visits, and another dimension coming from the diagnostics, say for example, somebody had x-rays or not and stuff like that. So you may have multi-dimension, but in our enhanced data source, we have only one dimension of medication data source that we are using here. And we have merged that information with our uh, complete case analysis data to create our analytic data. Okay. Now that we have merged our data and now we know what is the original data source that we are going to use, it is very possible for us to create a frequency count of say, for example, now it is not patient specific, but we, we already have an analytic data and we want to know how many patients are associated with this I-10 code. Remember what was this I-10 code? It was associated with the hypertension. And you can see, a lot of the variables in this data source are associated with high uh, hypertension. And then there was this additional code that was associated with a second frequency and so on. One important point you need to understand here is that when we are doing this analysis, and obviously for some of these ICD codes, you will see them repeatedly. So many patients will have this uh, uh, hypertension uh, medication. Uh, in this particular data source that you are interested about, uh, so for example, this overweight people uh, as well as the people who are at risk of diabetes, right? But you also may have some other ICD cores that are not that frequent, right? So for example, you may have uh, some lower counts uh, or lower frequency of some ICD cores that may be less than 20 or even less than 10, right? And And the rareness is not really a problem. It is possible that some confounder may be rare. It is certainly possible, but the problem begins is that when you are dealing with this type of uh, ICD code that, has, that are very rare and that are, say, for example, only have one or two counts or frequency, uh, um, then it creates some numerical problem. And you can imagine if you have, say, for example, hundreds of variables and many of these variables are associated with this very low cell counts that will create numeric instability in your data source uh, or the, in your analysis. And, and to avoid that problem, we might want to impose some restrictions so that we do not include too many of these variables. Uh, so that restriction could be included, uh, imposed in many different ways. One of the original ways that was proposed in the analysis in the 2009 
uh, Snevice paper was that they suggested that for from each dimension, we just take top 20 covariates that are associated with high prevalence, right? But there were some additional papers. Uh, so for example, this particular paper uh, then showed that uh, obviously you can do that to bring your numerical stability. But then again, if you just restrict your analysis to only top 200 covariates, uh, that might mean that you are not capturing some of the confounders that may be rare, and that can create some additional problem. If you really think about the problem, so the, uh, there are two different problems that are associated with this low count. One is that if you have a low cell count, obviously that can create some unstability because of the rareness of the, that particular covariate. The other problem can happen is that you have a ICD code that is non-existent. That is uh, like maybe in the original data you had that code, but in the subset of the data, you do not have any person who is associated with that particular code. And that will create all of the zeros in that data, right? And if that is the case, that is the case of zero variance. And that would obviously create problem in fitting of your regression. So you do not want that. So to restrict that, uh, if you look at um, one of the packages that implements high dimensional propensity score in R is known as the auto covariate selection package. And one of the options that they provide is that they try to uh, choose how many uh, minimum number of patients you want associated with uh, any particular code. And if you choose that, you do not necessarily need to think about this particular um, uh, option of how many, uh, so top uh, 200 prevalent cores or something like that. You can choose a large number there. So that may, that will make a uh, make the option uh, redundant in here. So for example, instead of uh, 2,000, 200, if I just select uh, 7,000 or something like that, uh, that option will not be uh, impacting your analysis anymore. But if you are uh, not restricting um, how many patients minimal uh, you need to have in each of the codes, then you might face some numerical stability. And th this is something that I think is very clever uh, that if you choose that um, option, it could be 10, it could be 20, and then you can reduce some of this numerical instability problem uh, that are usually associated with this high dimensional uh, nature of the analysis. All right, so in the long format data, when you have this um, one that data dimension, and I named it DX because it was coming from the uh, disease um, that were uh, measured based on which uh, medications that they were taking. And, and this, these are the three digit ICD codes that were collected. And in terms of the updated frequency after imposing these uh, minimum 20, you can see there are no covariates. And these are basically top and, and the tail um, observations that you can see. Uh, but there are no frequency that are less than 20 in, in some of these cases. And that is a clever way of dealing with this numerical instability problem. Um, in total, uh, there were 126 codes that were retained in the final analysis when we have restricted our analysis to um, uh, the codes that were associated with at least mini, uh, uh, minimally at least 20 patients per code. And that is basically our step two. And in this particular step, what we have done is we have basically chosen um, the covariance based on uh, the frequency. If the frequency is too low, we are not going to deal with those codes anymore. And that is primarily based on the numerical instability. All right. So in the third step, uh, what we do is we create binary variables out of those frequencies and um, sorry, out of those ICD codes. And the way we do it is that say for example, this D63.9 was the original ICD code and that is a code for anemia, right? And we convert that code into three different codes. Uh, and that is determined based on whether that code occurs, occurred only once in the data or whether the code occurs sporadic, uh, sporadically for that particular patient or that uh, code occurs uh, frequently for that patient. And 
based on these uh, three conditions, what we do is we convert each of these codes into three different codes. So try to understand this part. So in here, what we are doing is that for each code, we are creating three different uh, binary variables based on the recurrence of the variable based on these conditions, whether they occurred only once, whether they are occurring sporadically. And by sporadically, what uh, someone can interpret is that at least it happened more than the median, right? And whether that happened frequently, and that means that uh, at least more than 75 percentile uh, had that code. So for each of these codes, we are creating three different uh, binary variables. And these binary variables are known as the recurrent codes but there is a catch. It's not directly three times because sometimes the once and the median or the uh, frequent or the sporadic codes are exactly identical uh, because how they have occurred. And that then we do not keep both of the columns because think about in a regression when you are including two covariates that are identical that will create a multi multi-community problem and you cannot fit that regression. And that is why you cannot keep all of these um, recurrent covariates. You only keep the covariates that are distinct. And when we uh, included all of these uh, recurrent, uh, when we calculated all of these recurrent covariates and we calculated only the um, distinct covariates, we have uh, received only 143 distinct recurrent covariates. So, and these are only the coverage that are coming from the proxy. These are, this has nothing to do with the, uh, the, uh, the investigator specified coverage. These are all coverage that were coming from the proxies. So if you, if you look at the uh, table, uh, you can see all of these uh, 143 cores that were happening. And most of these cores are once or frequent. Uh, so there are no uh, sporadic um, cores in here. Right. In total, we have 143 distinct covariates that we will be then think about whether to include all of them or not, and that will be determined in the next step. So in the step three, we basically created uh, three versions of the course based on uh, the restrictions of whether they happen only once, sporadically or frequently, and then we have taken only the distinct ones, and then we achieved this 143. Um, and in the step four, what we will do is that we will try to select which of these 143 we want to include in our analysis. Okay. And th this particular step, this step four, is the most important step in the high dimensional propensity score algorithm because, like, this is where you determine how many of these 143 are you, you are going to use in your analysis. And there is a logic to it. And the logic came from a very old paper. This is a I'm talking about a, a 1966 paper. This is a paper that was written by uh, Bross and he suggested uh, this problem in a context where there was an unmeasured confounder. Um, even though you do not have the unmeasured confounder measured in your data, but you have some understanding of, of that confounder uh, and based on which you try to ad adjust your analysis. So that was basically the premise of the uh, original paper and the formula. So in that formula, what he suggested is that you basically need to know three things to get a general understanding of how biased your estimate is. So what are the three things? The first thing is that uh, prevalence of binary unmeasured confounder among the exposed, prevalence of binary unmeasured confounder among the unexposed, and the association between the binary unmeasured confounder and the outcome, right? So first two were based on the exposed and unexposed, and the third one was most about the outcome. If you can have some reasonable educated guess about these three components, you can basically plug in the numbers in here. So this is, uh, this is from the... Uh, exposed group and this is from the unexposed group and this is basically the risk ratio that you get from the association crude association with the outcome and the unmeasured confounder if you knew these three things or you if you can reasonably assume these three things then you can calculate the amount of bias uh, you will have in your analysis if you did not adjust for this unmeasured confounder all right so that that was a very simple formula 
uh, but that required some strong assumptions. What are the assumptions? Like these three assumptions. You need to ha have some understanding about the prevalence of in the exposed and unexposed and the, with the outcome. Thinking about our problem and, and the, our current context, our problem is actually much simpler than this because we do not have to assume anything about the unmeasured confounder. We actually have 143 covariates already present in our data that we have identified in our step three. And our job now is basically to check whether the bias amount of any of these 143 covariates are high or not. If the bias amount from any of these covariates are high, we basically consider those variables as variables that we need to adjust. And if the bias amount of any of these covariates are low, very close to zero or, or very close to uh, uh, having null effect, then we do not need to adjust for those variables. So that is basically the main understanding of the high dimensional propensity score is that this is how it selects which covariates to include in your analysis or not, all right? So in our analysis, what we, what we do, instead of this U or the unmeasured covariate, what we basically do is that we have this recurrent covariate that we have already identified uh, in this um, step three. Remember 143 of them. We use this formula 143 times to calculate the amount of bias associated with that recurrent uh, 143 recurrent covariates. Um, and say, so for example, uh, we we use the uh, DX, D63 ones and D75 sporadic ones and DE03 uh, frequent ones, and, and then we get the amount of bias. Um, and to do it in R, uh, in again, in the auto covariate selection package, you get the get prioritized covariates and, and you basically say how many of them you want. So it will basically give you the top 100 covariates. And the other thing uh, this package does, and this is also done in the literature, is that instead of the original uh, original bias amount, they convert it to they first take an absolute of that, and then they convert it to a log scale, so that the null value is close to zero in that scenario. So you you are just basically checking whether the value that you are getting uh, in terms of the absolute log of multiplicative bias, whether that is close to zero or not. And this is a ranked um, uh, list of the bias amount in terms of the, in the log scale. And you can see some of these are very close to zero and some of these have um, are deviating from zero. And if you just translate some of these cores that you are seeing, say for example, I-10, if you remember, this is associated with hypertension and this R73 is associated with elevated blood, blood glucose level. If you look at this covariate, you see hypertension and elevated uh, blood glucose level and stuff like that. These are something that are highly associated with your outcome, right? And uh, what was our outcome? Risk of diabetes and, and hypertension and elevated blood sugar and stuff like that. Those are highly associated with this uh, outcome variable. So these are not some random uh, covariates that we are picking. We, we are basically choosing some variables that are going to be useful for an, our analysis, but we have not considered them as a covariate in our primary analysis or the investigator specific covariates. One other small point that I want to make here is that in this particular analysis, I am basically using the BROS formula to identify which of the variables are useful uh, for our further analysis. This is somewhat different than our propensity score analysis because in our propensity score analysis, what we basically do is we usually check the standardized mean difference, right? We make a table, uh, a two by two table, sorry, a, 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 a stratified table based on the uh, exposure status. And we classify all of the covariates and we try to calculate the standardized mean difference of each of these covariates in the two exposure groups. And we then try to identify based on that uh, mean standardized difference, whether the difference is uh, greater, greater than some specific cut point, such as 0 0.1 or 0 0.2, whatever cut point makes sense for the particular uh, research question at hand. And you basically try to see which of these covariates are, um, are imbalanced in terms of the standardized mean difference. But there is a key difference between the standardized mean difference and this BROS formula. 
The key difference is in the Bross formula, if you look at the formula one more time, this is a formula where it is using the association between the unmeasured conformed and the outcome, right? And in the standardized mean difference formula, there is, we do not use the information about the outcome. We only use the information about the exposure, whether that uh, uh, covariant is um, stratified by exposed and un unexposed, and we just use the mean standardized, uh, standardized mean difference to calculate whether that covariant is balanced or imbalanced. But in here, we are directly using the outcome information to choose a variable, whether that variable is useful in our analysis or not. And that is the main difference and maybe one of the most controversial uh, point of the high dimensional propensity score is that in the high dimensional propensity score, you are actually using the association with the outcome to choose a covariate in your analysis. This is a proxy variable, obviously, uh, but in, in the main propensity score analysis or the or in the streamlined propensity score analysis, usually this is highly discouraged because they say that you should not look at the outcome when you are choosing a variable. Uh, but one of the other differences that you also need to keep in your mind is that we are not talking about investigator specified covariate. We're basically talking about here the proxy information. So that is one of one of the differences that you need to keep in your mind uh, that we are basically talking about two different type of terminologies and and type of covariates that we are dealing with here. In the propensity score analysis, we generally do not deal with proxy information. We only deal with the investigator specific covariates. And in the uh, high dimensional propensity score, the covariate selection is actually only happening in the proxy information, not in the investigator spe specific covariates. So the context is slightly different here. Okay. All right. So. Once we have all of our um, bias information or the bias multiplier information uh, in the log scale or log absolute scale, what we do is we can try to create a density, density plot out of all of these um, log absolute bias. And you can see many of them are close to zero, but there are some that are uh, as high as 0 0.12 um, and so on. In the literature, however, there is no particular cut point that is proposed for the uh, log absolute bias. So for example, in the SMD or the standardized mean difference, there is a established cut point of 0 0.1 to determine whether a variable is balanced or imbalanced. But in the uh, high dimensional propensity score algorithm or in the uh, context of the log absolute bias, there is no cut point that was proposed. But in the literature, usually it is proposed that you can uh, you can select top 100 variables. Say, for example, top 100 variables that are in here uh, that you need to consider in your analysis. If you are dealing with the larger data sources, you can also deal with 500 uh, proxy variables uh, that are selected by this Bross formula. So the top ranked uh, uh, variables or the proxy variables that are associated with high amount of log absolute bias. Those are the information that you need to select. Okay, so once you select those information, you basically uh, are now dealing with two different types of information. One information is the investigator specified covariates, and another list of covariates is the uh, proxies that you have just included in your analysis based on this uh, uh, proxy information, and you have selected how many proxies you want. And in this particular analysis, we have selected 100 proxy information that we want to include in our analysis. So now think about this. We, have, we are now talking about 125 covariates. Previously, we already have 25 uh, investigator specified covariates, and now we are adding 100 more. That makes it 130, uh, uh, 125 uh, information proxy, uh, proxy as well as investigator specified covariates in our analysis. So in total, 125 covariates. Okay, so now that we have identified our proxy information, so remember what was the high dimensional propensity score algorithm? In that propensity score algorithm, we were talking about including the covariates that were selected by the investigators. And we are also talking about the empirical covariates or the recurrent covariates that were selected based on the Bross formula, right? So in the high dimensional propensity score, the only difference is 
is that we are basically including this proxy information, 100, 100 proxy information in our analysis and uh, the rest of the analysis is very similar to how we do our analysis in the regular propensity score analysis. So in this analysis, you can see we are adding this investigator specified coverage that we have already seen before. And then we are adding this 100 proxy information that we have just selected based on the uh, BROS formula. And once we have cal calculated all of this, we can create a uh, propensity score. And in this propensity score, you can see the overlap for the exposed and unexposed group. And you can see basically there are sufficient overlap in the two groups for us to make a reasonable comparison about these two groups. Uh, one other important fact is that in this particular analysis, I'm using uh, the propensity scores in terms of inverse probability weight. But if you want, you can also use these propensity scores for matching or stratification um, and so on. Uh, so in this particular workshop, I'm basically focusing on the inverse probability, uh, the propensity scores used as the inverse probability weight. And when you are using the inverse probability weight, it is always a good idea to check the summary statistic uh, from for the weights. And you can see the uh, statistic goes from one to 53. And whether this, this 53 is too much or not depends on your sample size. Remember what was our sample size in our analysis? More than 7,000. Right, so in this analysis, at least there is one person who was represented uh, 53 times uh, compared to the person who was representing uh, himself or herself. So that uh, type of inflation of um, the probability weight or the uh, or the inverse probability weight is not too much in my opinion, and that is why we do not consider 53 as an extreme value. Um, and, and remember, see if you look at this. There are not much um, patients who, who are overrepresented in, in this particular analysis. So I would not be worried too much. Uh, in What I would be worried is, is checking the balance, uh, by the way. So for example, these red dots that you are seeing are associated with the uh, standardized mean difference for all of these different coverage that we had before the waiting and after waiting, you can see these uh, somewhat blue lines where you can see all of these blue lines are within the 0.1 uh, absolute value. So we can say after the waiting, we are getting a much better uh, pseudo population where the covariates are uh, adequately balanced. And you should always compare uh, Oh, so before you, you compare, you, you can, uh, once you have the uh, weights, inverse probability weights, you can try to estimate the odds ratios. And how do you estimate the odds ratios? You basically use the weights to uh, inflate your population to a pseudo population. So say for example, when I'm using the uh, GLM, I'm basically using the weights that I have calculated based on the propensity scores in my previous step. And I basically estimated the uh, log odds ratio and the log odds ratio was 0 0.42. If you are interested about other type of uh, association measures such as the risk difference and so on, you can also use the GLM, but in that case, you have to change your family from binomial to Gaussian and the link from uh, logic to identity uh, to get your risk difference estimates. And you can see that there is a, uh, estimate of risk difference in that scenario. So this is this is the uh, this is the log or ratio that you are getting in the high dimensional propensity score algorithm, right? Uh, one of the things that are very important is that even though when you are using the high dimensional propensity score algorithm, it is always important to remember that you are basically dealing with a lot of proxy information. And remember one of the things that I have told you earlier is that when you are adjusting for proxy information, yes, that is helpful because you are reducing bias, but it is often not clear whether you are overestimating or underestimating because the direction of bias reduction is often not clear with the proxy information. 
right? And that is why it is always important to also do a regular propensity score analysis and compare the result with the high dimensional propensity score information. Yes, so one of the questions that I, am, I have received in the uh, chat box is that uh, when we are using enhanced, obviously enhanced is a complex survey. This is not a simple random sampling, right? And when we have um, some complex survey, we need to use the survey weights to get the odds ratios corrected so that the original target population is uh, targeted. And we also need to include the strata and cluster information so that we can make sure our variance estimates are correct, right? So in our analysis, as I am basically demonstrating the propensity score analysis, high dimensional propensity score analysis, I did not want to overcomplicate my analysis, and that is not uh, that is why I did not use the sampling weights. But if you want to do the analysis properly, what you have to do is that with this uh, inverse probability weights that you are getting, you also need to multiply your sampling weights so that you can target the original population. This is not wrong either, because like the, in this situation, what you are doing is that you, your target population is the sample. You are not tar targeting the uh, US population. But if you wanted to target your US population, then you would have to mul multiply these propensity score weights with your sampling weights. Uh, so for those who are late in joining and do not have the uh, repo, uh, here is the link for the repo that I'm pasting one more time. Okay, so one of the other question is that uh, regular propensity score analysis is basically excluding the data-driven uh, uh, selected covariates. And that is absolutely right. The main difference of uh, regular propensity score and high dimensional propensity score analysis is basically uh, inclusion of uh, the proxy information, only this part. So if you are not including this part, then that becomes your regular propensity score analysis. Yes, that is absolutely correct. Okay. Um, and when you do your regular propensity score analysis, see, in this case, you do not have the proxy information. You are just basically using the investigator specific covariates. And that is how you create your propensity score. And you again check your overlap, you again check your uh, weight, and you again check your balance. And then you can use those weights using only the investigator specific covariates to estimate your odds ratios. Uh, and you can see that now the uh, log odds ratio is coming out to be slightly higher, 0 0.68, where your previous log odds ratio was, if you remember correctly, it was 0 0.42. Uh, so there was slight difference. So you can, when you compare these two, you can get some understanding of when you are adjusting, what is the adjustment uh, happening and in which direction this adjustment is going. Uh, and that can give you some understanding of uh, where this is eventually going. Uh, and also, you can also try to check um, if you did a crude analysis without any adjustment of any covariate. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about uh, no adjustment of proxy information, information as well as no adjustment of the investigator specified covariates. And that would give you basically a crude estimate of the log odds ratio, and that is 0 0.73. Right? OK. Um, Again, remember in, in one of our steps when we were talking about um, the creation of the high dimensional propensity score in step five, we did talk about um, how many proxy variables you want to select. And remember we chose 100, right? But that was not based on any theory. We basically chose 100 because uh, we we had in total 143 covariates and then we chose to select 100. Uh, to have a general understanding of the direction of like how much uh, this proxy is contributing in changing your odds ratio estimate, you can basically do a 
repeated analysis uh, choosing different number of proxies. Say, for example, in this plot, what I'm basically doing is that I'm basically plotting all of these odds ratios as well as the confidence associated confidence intervals, right? And you can see this is the analysis when I just adjusted for 10 proxies. This is the estimate when I just adjusted for 20 proxies. This is the analysis when I adjusted for, say, for example, 45 proxies. And this is the information when I have adjusted for 115 proxies and so on. So you can basically try to do a repeated analysis based on different number of proxies. And, and that will give you some interesting information. And see, see, for example, at the very beginning, when you were adding some in, some proxy information, it was uh, slightly volatile, but at some point it stabilized a bit in the sense that uh, when it was 50 coverage that you have adjusted up to this um, 115, uh, basically you can see somewhat of a flat line, right? That means that you, among these, um, the information or the coverage that you are adding, it is not changing too much. But once you cross the point of 115, then you can see there are some drastic changes in your analysis uh, or, or ratios. So that will probably give you some understanding of what should be your K. If I were uh, doing this analysis, I would probably choose somewhere in between and that would probably give me some general understanding. Okay, I have received some question in the chat box before going to the next break. I'm, I want to answer those questions. So the first question is, is this using IPW? Yes, this is the inverse probability weight, weighted analysis all the way through. I'm not using any kind of matching in our in this particular workshops implementation. I'm basically showing the uh, analysis using the inverse probability weights. Second question is, I'm wondering whether a higher number of COVID would induce an overfitting issue in the PS analysis. That is exactly correct. You see, when the estimates are changing in this scenario, this is something I would be very cautious because uh, maybe you are using some information that are not useful anymore, and that is changing your direction of your um, our ratio in that scenario. OK, so does the order of adding covariate matter? Uh, Actually, it does. So uh, the way these were ordered is that these are the top 10 covariates that were chosen based on the Ross formula. Remember the log absolute bias multiplier that we were using? So this was actually ordered in the sense that this is the top 10, this is the top 15, top 20, and so on. So in terms of that order, we are basically adjusting. If we were not ordering and we are basically adjusting random number of covariates uh, here and there, we would not get a clear understanding of the direction at which the estimates are changing uh, when you are estimating more and more. One other restriction that were originally proposed in the literature was that um, uh, what should be the restriction in terms of um, the prevalence of the covariate. Remember in the step two, when we talk about the prevalence of covariate uh, and we were more worried about uh, whether we are having some zero cell or the low cell frequency, we, we chose that we want um, N to be 200. Uh, and you can this is something that you can also check using this sensitivity analysis. You can choose the top 10 prevalent coverage in step two, and, and you can do the repeat the whole analysis again, and you can try to see whether that analysis changed anything over time. Um, and these are some of the sensitivity analysis that are actually very useful because, as I said before, uh, proxy information are helpful in reducing bias, but often they do not give us proper information in terms of like in which direction. Uh, it is adjusting. So it is always a good idea to compare number one with the propensity score analysis itself, as well as doing this type of sensitivity analysis that would give you some clear understanding of why it is going when you are adding more and more coverage and so on. Okay, so it, let us take a 10 minute break again, and then we will come back in 10 minutes, and then we will talk about some of the challenges of high dimensional propensity score algorithm, as well as 
some of the machine learning and double robust extensions of high dimensional propensity square algorithm. All right, and in the meanwhile, if you have any question, feel free to post it in the chat. Uh, so see you in 10 minutes. Thank you.
Hello, everybody. Um, so for those who might have joined a bit late, uh, these are the workshop materials. Uh, I have pasted the link in the chat box and you can take a look at that um, to see the materials. Okay, so I have a question in the chat box and, and the question is more about the overfitting or the multi community problems in terms of the propensity score estimation. Um, and this is a common understanding about the propensity score analysis is that propensity score analysis is not supposed to generalize and you are only dealing with the data at hand and um, you should not think more about uh, the generalization and you just check the SMD or balance and, and uh, you do not need to think more about it. Um, I think, so this is something that I, I pro we probably have to think a bit about. So for example, we if we go to the propensity score analysis, uh, this is something that I have described in the in the materials is that uh, if you look at some of the early uh, guidelines about the propensity score, this is exactly what they have said that you need to take into account of all of the coverage that you know, also some of the uh, model specifications um, beyond main effect. And that means that you need to consider the interaction term as well as the polynomial term and whatever other uh, model specification that makes sense. And, and it is okay to slightly over parameterize your propensity score estimation uh, if that helps uh, to improve your balance, um, right? So, and this is not new. I mean, this is something that has been proposed in the literature for a while. Uh, but obviously, there is a limit to it. You cannot just make your uh, propensity score model um, over parameterized and, and think that there, there will not be ever any consequence. Obviously, there is a limit to it that about which you need to be careful. Say, for example, there is a paper uh, that was published in, um, I think it was, this was in 2016, and um, they showed that um, overfitting can lead to the inflation of variance. Um, and, and that can be problematic uh, when you are trying to estimate the treatment effect uh, from a uh, propensity score analysis. Um, and also uh, in the propensity score analysis, we are usually less concerned about the standard errors of the coefficients that we see in our uh, propensity score model fit. But then again, there are some additional literature where you can see um, if you do not properly diagnose, diagnose your propensity score model, that can lead you to unstable estimates as well. There are some recent liter literature, specifically those that are coming from the double machine learning literature, they know more about the double cross-fitting and double cross-fitting is a procedure that is um, basically an extension of uh, cross validation process that we usually use in the prediction problems. So double cross fitting is a procedure that is a tailored cross validation process suitable for the propensity score analysis or, or suitable for the causal inference analysis where we, we are not only interested about predicting the outcome, but we also are interested about the association of that outcome with the exposure. Uh, so there are I think enough understanding now um, to deviate from that thinking process that propensity score is more about uh, just the data at hand and, and overfitting is a problem. Uh, we cannot just over parameterize our uh, propensity score model and, and think that there are no uh, consequences, right? So if you are interested, look at some of the uh, literature ahead. And this is something that is um, a, uh, recent work that I have been doing where it also shows uh, some of the consequences of um, some of the over parameterization and choosing some of the very strong uh, machine learning algorithms, specifically those uh, that do not follow the Donsker class. And, and there are some consequences 
that you can remedy by using some of this cross-fitting type of algorithm, right? Hopefully that will give you uh, some insight. Thank you. Okay, so let us move on to, we, we did talk about some of the challenges. Uh, sorry, we, we did talk about the propensities, high dimensional propensity score algorithm already. Let us talk about some of the challenges of using the high dimensional propensity score algorithm. Uh, remember, uh, the core of the high dimensional propensity score algorithm is basically the Bross formula. And if you look at the Bross formula, uh, remember in our analysis, we had 143 covariates and we have used the Bross formula 143 times to get all of these uh, log absolute uh, bias estimates, right? That means what? We are basically univariately selecting or, or bivariately selecting all of these uh, associated proxy variables. And we are basically not using a multivariate model. And the problem that begins is that, say for example, in the presence of a already selected proxy, another proxy might not be useful anymore. That might not be a confounder anymore, right? So in, in, a, in a multivariate structure, the list of confounders may change because like some of these uh, confounders are already present in the model so that the rest of the confounders are not useful anymore. So that is why it is very important to think about a bit multi in, in the structure of multivariate uh, modeling uh, so that this type of problem do not act occur. Also, there are some machine learning methods such as lasso, elastic net, and so on that are very helpful in dealing with some of this multicollinearity related problem, especially in the situation where multiple of these variables are giving you basically the same information or they are highly correlated. So in that type of problem, maybe we need to think about multivariate structure and some of this lasso type of model, and that will probably give us uh, some better ways of dealing with these proxies rather than this univariate proxies that were proposed in the high dimensional propensity square algorithm. Also, there are like, as I have dis discussed uh, in response to the previous question, like there might be overfitting problem and sample splitting is a uh, useful strategy in the prediction modeling. And, and however, it is true that in the causal inference literature, um, it, we need more investigation about understanding the sample splitting or this uh, double cross splitting procedure that I just talked about. Um, how useful they are, we need to do more investigation, right? In terms of controversy, as I have described earlier, uh, the Bross formula uses the information associated with the outcome. And that is something that pro sometimes do not sit well with the people who are very familiar with the propensity score uh, framework and the literature who do not want to look at the outcome to select the covariates. And, and and for them, it, it, obviously, this is a deviation from the original principles of the propensity score literature when you are using outcome, the relationship with the outcome to determine whether a variable should be included in the analysis or not, right? So, I mean, obviously, that is a problem and that is obviously a deviation from the original analysis. But then again, you have to understand one of the other assumptions of the propensity score analysis is that all of the variables or the confounders are measured, right? Obviously the whole premise of high dimensional propensity score analysis is that, that some variables are not measured. And that is why we are trying to rectify this situation. And uh, we are trying to come up with a reasonable conclusion or solution uh, so that we can empirically try to obtain some information from the large data sources where that we have access to and we are trying to leverage our huge or big data to get some understanding of how to reduce confounding, okay? All right, so obviously, as I have say, said earlier, like some of the sensitivity analysis and model diagnostics are always important when you are uh, doing any kind of analysis because obviously you are dealing with a lot of covariates and a lot of diagnostics and carefulness should be embedded within your analysis. Okay, so briefly looking at the literature, say for example, I, I did this search in the PubMed and I uh, wanted to understand uh, what are the things that people generally do in terms of the high dimensional propensity score algorithm 
um, enhancement and I found these seven papers, right? So this paper from 2018, they used lasso and uh, I, this is me in 2018. I have also used lasso extension of the high dimensional propensity score. There is a Franklin paper in 2015 that also used lasso. I and Franklin both used uh, some sort of hybrid algorithm as well. Um, but there are other algorithms such as in the machine learning literature, there are some algorithms known as the ensemble learning that basically um, collects information from different type of learners and, and combines those information. And these ensemble learners are also used in the high to en enhance the high dimensional propensity score algorithm. Uh, there are some additional uh, literature. Uh, so for example, this one was a review, not, not so relevant for our scenario. This one was a situation where they considered the time varying interventions, not relevant for our analysis. And this is a situation that, where they have used a low dimensional data source where they just included additional 10 covariate, which is not really something that we are doing here. We are trying to include as many as possible to identify uh, how we can best utilize the large data sources that we have. Uh, outside of this, some information that we you are seeing here from the PubMed, um, some of these other studies are also there that are not uh, directly available in PubMed through these uh, keywords that I have used. Uh, and some of these are again using some of these lasso methods. Say, for example, this Weber Pels use this lasso method and this Nevis use this lasso method. Um, they have also used some sort of deep learning method uh, in the Weber Pels paper, uh, uh, and it is called the auto encoders. Uh, other papers have used the CTMLA algorithm. Uh, I do not necessarily um, have included CTMLA type of algorithm in this particular discussion because, like, this is a slightly more complex model. Uh, with some of the strong assumptions that I um, have some disagreement about. Uh, but then again, there are some TMLE and the super learner or the ensemble learner method that are also used in the literature as an alternative to high dimensional propensity score. But I thought that they are not using the full potential because when you are using this TMLE algorithm or the double robust approach that you are, uh, that are proposed in the statistics literature, uh, sometimes they are not using uh, super learners or non-parametric mo models, and they are basically uh, relying on parametric models. So that is not really fully uh, unleashing the power of the TML method. And, and when they use the super learner method or the non-parametric methods uh, as learners, uh, sometimes they did not use TML. So either case, like I, I kind of thought that that was an incomplete literature. Um, and, and that is why uh, I thought it, it might be a good idea to also use TMLE with and without um, some of these super learner or the ensemble learner methods and try to see whether they come up with some interesting results or not. So anyway, basically from this literature, what I understood is that yes, people have used some sort of machine learning methods that takes into account of the multivariate structure of the high dimensional propensity score instead of the original univariate high dimensional propensity score suggestion, right? And in the next few slides uh, or the pages, what I'm going to do is basically, I'm going to explain what is the logic that they were using to create this, say for example, lasso-based method, uh, the multivariate method instead of the univariate method, right? Okay. So if we want to use Bross formula as a core of high dimensional propensity score, uh, there is no extension of Bross formula that is available that takes into account of multivariate structure, right? So if we are going to think about this extension of Bross formula or extension of high dimensional propensity score that takes into account of multivariate structure of the proxy information, Bross formula cannot accommodate it directly in a straightforward fashion. So we probably need to go back to the drawing board and think about how do we then select our confounders? or the proxy variables. Okay, so one of the things that was interesting from the Bross formula is that they were using or selecting covariates based on their strength of association with the outcome, right? And that is something that we can easily do because uh, think about in the propensity score literature, what are the variables that they suggest us to include in the propensity score literature? 
uh, or the promise receiver model. So noise variable should not be used. The variables that are related to the outcome, but not re sorry, related to the exposure, not related to the outcome. These are somewhat discouraged to use because some of these covariates or variables could be instrumental variables and that can amplify your bias. And some of the confounders you need to include and some of the variables that are unrelated to the treatment, but related to the outcome, those are variables that are encouraged. And let me explain why that is the reason. Because when we are dealing with the confounders, obviously confounders are something that are, after adjusting for the confounder, you are going to get an unbiased association. So that is something that you absolutely need to control. When you are talking about instrumental variables that are only associated with the exposure but not the outcome, you should should avoid from them because like they um, can amplify bias as well as increase your standard error. Uh, if you have a precision variable that is highly associated with the outcome, has nothing to do with the treatment variable, uh, you should include it because including these type of variables can help you reduce the amount of standard errors of the treatment effect estimate. Noise variable should not be included because noise variables are something that are um, only going to increase the standard error of your estimate, right? So in terms of the overall picture, if you think about um, what are the things that we should be including in our propensity score analysis, the general suggestion is that instrumental variable, no, common effects, no, effect of the outcome, no, mediator variable, no, and uh, obviously you cannot include the unmeasured confounder, but then again, you should be trying to include the proxy of unmeasured confounder. So that is a given, that's not a problem. Uh, so in terms of the variables that you need to adjust in a propensity score model, basically those are the confounders and the risk factor for the outcome are the precision variables, right? Uh, so there is just one thing that is common among the risk factor of the outcome and the measured con confounders. And that is that both of them are highly associated with the outcome. So what we can basically do is when we are dealing with proxy information, we can basically try to identify the variables that are highly associated with the outcome and basically choose those uh, variables that are highly associated with, with the outcome as our proxy variable. That will bypass our need to use the BROS formula anymore. And that is basically what is done in the LASSO implementation. In the LASSO implementation, what is basically done is that you basically, develop a model of the outcome based on the confounder variable as well as all of the proxy variables, right? And remember that this is the model of the outcome, not exposure, right? And then you run a lasso on it and you try to identify which of these proxy information retain after um, running the lasso. And you just select the variables that are retained in the lasso and you use those retained variable in the propensity score analysis, um, right? So in that case, see here, you are again selecting some variables based on your lasso uh, and you are using those proxy information in addition to the investigator specified covariate. Very similar situation to the Bross formula selection where you have selected your top 100. But in this case, lasso actually selects you some number of covariates. You, like it does not give you exactly 100 or there is no way for you to control. Uh, it has to be 100 or 50 or something like that. Lasso will provide you some information um, and you just use those information in your Lasso. And to implement you uh, the Lasso, what you basically need to do is you just need to run an outcome model based on the exposure variable as well as the proxy information. And you just try to select the variables that come out of the Lasso. And basically you be, you rebuild your model based on this investigator specific covariance as well as this proxy uh, list that you selected out of this lasso and you just um, use the inverse probability weight formula uh, to calculate your um, inverse probability weights that you use in your outcome model to weight the outcome model formula. And, and that will give you some estimate of the log odds Remember what was our high dimensional propensity score algorithm uh, log odds uh, estimate? It was 0 0.42. And in our case, we are getting 0 0.41. So very similar estimate. Um, and in terms of the properties, um, in one of my papers in 2018, I have showed that when you are using a hybrid type of method that is uh, taking power from both of the high dimensional propensity score as well as some of this lasso method, 
you can get better statistical properties when you are using these type of uh, methods to build the multivariate structure of the proxy information. Another estimate that you can do is that you basically try to select the proxy variables based on the BROS formula. Say, for example, remember, we, we only dealt with uh, 100, BROS, uh, 100 covariates based on the BROS formula. And then we use the outcome um, lasso information so that uh, only on the selected covariates uh, that were selected based on the uh, high dimensional propensity score based on the BROS formula. And that brings me from 100 to 52 covariates uh, or the uh, proxy variables that you need to include in your analysis. And you uh, repeat the whole analysis and you get that um, log odds ratio of 0 0.44. Uh, again, very close estimates. Um, and that is another estimate um, that you can use. Again, as I have said before, in, in one of my paper in 2018, I have shown that this estimate um, performs better uh, compared to the regular LTPS or regular pure uh, machine learning methods, uh, right? Okay, so remember in the literature, there was something else that was also discussed that when you are using a super learner and super learner could mean that you are using a logistic regression and you are using lasso and you are using some sort of spline method uh, and then you are estimating your propensity scores out of this. So there is one important distinction between the method that I just described before and the method that I'm describing now. Because in the method that I have described before, I was selecting covariates based on their association with the outcome. But in here, when I'm using the ensemble method, uh, what I'm doing is that I am selecting methods, uh, sorry, selecting uh, proxies uh, based on their association with the exposure variable. And that is a dangerous proposition because like sometimes when you are selecting variables based on their strong association with the exposure, uh, it is possible that sometimes those variables do not have anything to do with the outcome. And if uh, you are selecting only the variables that are associated with the exposure variable, obviously these are some of these variables that are going to be confirmed, uh, but sometimes you might end up choosing variables that are instrumental variables. Uh, right, so this is a very different analogy or, or different process of estimating the uh, uh, treatment effect estimate uh, by using the ensemble learning or the super learning. Um, and when you estimate, you can see the uh, estimated odds ratio is 0 0.47. Okay, uh, and, and the um, last method that I'm going to show is is a double robust method. And double robust method means that you only have, need to have one of the models correct. You need to have your treatment model right or your outcome model right. Uh, and based on that, you can try to um, estimate the treatment effect estimate using this TMLE or the double robust method that are associated with uh, interesting statistical properties. And usually um, these estimates are associated with uh, properties uh, that are more interesting than the regular propensity score estimates. Um, and when you use this, um, uh, use this uh, propensity scores that you have created based on the ensemble learning, um, you do not have to uh, repeat the analysis again. You just in insert the propensity score analysis, propensity scores that you have estimated using this um, ensemble method. You can directly uh, put them within the TMLE function, uh, within the TMLE package in the GW, uh, G1W uh, argument, and that will provide you uh, some estimates uh, from, the, uh, from the outcome model. And uh, this is the log uh, odds ratio, and the log odds ratio is 0 0.43 uh, that you are getting. Um, so, out of all of the estimates that we have compared so far, uh, so this is a picture where you can see this is a crude adjustment and the crude adjustment is showing the odds ratio of two. So log, log odds ratio is 0 0.73 and the odds ratio is uh, two. And the uh, regular propensity score is associated with uh, 1.98, right? So the crude and the regular propensity score estimates were somewhat close to and 1.98. 
Uh, but when you used the high dimensional propensity score information, that means that uh, in any information wire, I have used the proxies, uh, the estimates are different than the regular propensity score estimates. And as I have explained, the ways I have used the propensity score estimates are very different. So for example, this is the, uh, this is the regular high dimensional propensity score estimate. And in the regular propensity score estimate, the estimate is 1.52. And you can see I'm using the regular lasso, sorry, the pure lasso method, the machine learning method. And I'm getting very similar estimate. When I'm using the hybrid method, that means that I have first used the BROS formula to select 100 covers and then uh, ran an, uh, a lasso method to further subselect the uh, useful proxy information. That is the hybrid method, and that also gave me a very close estimate. I've used the TMLE method uh, with only uh, logistic regression as the only learner, as well as three different learners in the super learner. And they also gave me very similar estimate. I also ran the super learner, which gave me slightly off, but uh, very different estimate. So you can see from this picture, is that whenever you use the proxy information, the estimates are sort of comparable, but when you did not use the proxy information or when you use just the crude information, the estimates are like uh, around two, whereas all of these estimates are uh, between uh, 1.52 to 1.6 um, in here. Okay. Uh, is there any question so far about some of these uh, machine learning extensions or some of the other uh, methods that we have talked about so far. So one of the question is, we believe that the estimates from the proxy variables are less biased. So this is an interesting question because we don't know, uh, because based on the analysis, um, we do not know the true parameters. And when we do not know the true parameters, there is no benchmark for us to compare, right? Uh, but then again, uh, there has been a number of simulations as well as the analytic studies that compared the regular propensity score and the high dimensional propensity score algorithms results where the high dimensional propensity score algorithm included the proxy information Generally, uh, we received some favorable uh, results showing that using proxy actually helped in those analysis. But this is something that is very hard to generalize. Uh, it might um, depend um, in context to context. Say, for example, if you have uh, some unmeasured confounding, say, for example, when you, you are working with um, health administrative data sources. So in the Canadian health administrative data sources, sometimes what happens is that there is no body mass index or the BMI information directly measured, right? And, and sometimes we, we also need to think about different proxy information, but sometimes it is not possible to find a suitable proxy. Uh, and that is when uh, some of these additional um, ICD 910 course could come into play in helping us in reducing the bias of not adjusting for some of the useful confounders that are, that are not present in the analysis. So again, I mean, this is a context de dependent question. And if your data source have some useful proxies that are supplementing those unmeasured confounders, sure, that will reduce your bias. But if you are dealing with a data source where you have some proxies, but that are not good supplements of the unmeasured confounder that you have, and, and that might create uh, might not provide you as good result. So I see there is uh, someone raised their hand. Do you have a question? Uh, I, I don't know whether you can turn on your mic and ask the question. Yeah, that's me. Uh, I just have a quick question. Uh, so um, are you aware of like um, attempts in the literature? So I'm just drawing parallels with the propensity score um, calibration. So basically maybe we can like the example you mentioned, um, the body mass index. So maybe we can get a cohort from the administrative claims data, and then like we prospectively collect um, their like, for example, body mass index, and then generate a propensity score that based on the true um, variable and compare this to the proxy that the high dimensional score uh, used, 
And if they are the same, we can say with some confidence that, oh, this proxy um, helps while we don't have the body mass index. But if they differed, so maybe this proxy just changed the effect estimate, but maybe it made it more biased. Yeah, I mean, that is one way to maybe check whether the, um, the huge amount of proxy information that you are incorporating in your analysis, whether they are helping or not. Um, but I, I have not seen some such comparison in the literature directly where they have measured something and they try to compare it with. Uh, what I have seen is that in the literature, they have used high dimensional propensity score and they have used the regular propensity score and they have tried to compare the results with a, say for example, clinical trial result. And that way, uh, sometimes they have claimed that using some of the proxy information where the proxies had some interesting supplement of the original analysis that had helped. Uh, but you bring an interesting point that uh, maybe it is possible to prospectively collect some information that can be included and, and checked. Uh, but yeah, um, I have not seen that analysis in the literature. The other point that I have already mentioned is that we are dealing with some sort of proxies here, right? And, and we often do not know how to interpret them directly. And we are relying on this analysis to uh, say that maybe we, we are adjusting for this uh, unmeasured confounder. We have to understand that this is basically an assumption under which we are operating. We are operating under the assumption that all of the information that we are collecting from the proxies are supplementing for the unmeasured confounders. Right, and it depends on the how good the surrogates are, how good the proxies are of the uh, of the original unmeasured confounding information. So this is again an untestable assumption, and, and probably we need to repeat the analysis in multiple data sources before we come to a reasonable conclusion. And that is one of the reasons why I suggest. Uh, to use uh, high dimensional propensity score algorithm to use as a sensitivity analysis and not the main analysis. I hope that makes sense. All right, so uh, the next question I had was, um, what other ML algorithm could be used? Actually, if you look at the literature, um, you can see there are a couple of different algorithms that are used in the literature. So uh, most popular ones are um, obviously lasso method, elastic net method approach, and there are some previous method that uh, this paper have used. Um, well, this one, this paper have used some tree based methods such as uh, I think random forest method. Um, and there are other papers where they have used a um, deep learning method, uh, which is a, a uh, known as the autoencoder. This is basically an extension of the principal component analysis in the deep learning version. Um, uh, yes, so any variable selection method that can help you identify variables based on their association with the outcome. Uh, those type of variable selection methods can be used. Say, for example, when you are using lasso, lasso is directly a variable selection method that can be automatically used. Um, another thing that can be used is that when you are using, say, for example, something like bagging, boosting, or random forest, those all give you some variable importance measures based on which you can identify which variables are more important and less important in predicting your outcome, right? So you can basically select the top uh, 500 or top 100 variables based on this uh, variable importance uh, measures, and, and then you can do this uh, variable selections uh, of the proxies uh, based on those machine learning methods. All right. Okay. That actually brings us to um, the last point that I want to bring about, uh, and this is more about the reporting of of the high dimensional propensity score algorithm. And if you look at the literature, last year there uh, uh, the two, two reporting guidelines came in the same journal um, and, and the guidelines were very similar <laughs> and, and it was published in the same year. 
as well as there are two other reviews that were published and this particular review was more targeted towards the machine learning and this review is more targeted toward the high dimensional propensity square algorithm um, unfortunately for many of these reviews they underplay the usefulness of machine learning methods um, even though it was uh, repeatedly shown that machine learning methods are actually interesting in terms of some of the statistical properties that we have observed. Uh, but yeah, maybe we have to write another new review um, that highlights that issue a bit. In terms of the reporting, we probably need to think about um, what makes our description reproducible so that just by reading the description if anybody else had access to the same data that you have access to whether they can reproduce your analysis right so in that context obviously the most important part is that we have to think about the number of data dimensions that were used so in our analysis if you remember we were only using the medication data dimension but if you were using um health administrative data sources, you could use the hospital data, emergency visit data, physician data, billing data, and stuff like that. So all of these different data sources that you could use in your health administrative data sources. What was done to remove the proxies that are problematic? Remember, we, we removed the proxies that are related to obesity and diabetes. And similarly, you can think about removing the instrumental variables as well as removing uh, variables that has um, that are close proxies to the covariates that are already utilized in the analysis as investigator specified covariates. Uh, some of the parameters we need to choose. So for example, in terms of granularity, we have chosen three digit. Depending on the data source, you might uh, increase it to three digit to five digit. In our analysis, we have chosen n equal to two hundred, where n equals the prevalence filter. Um, whether or not this prevalence filter is useful or not, this is debatable, uh, but uh, we can always do a sensitivity analysis by increasing the number of uh, prevalence filter uh, and, and try to see whether uh, there is any stabilizing point where we can say with confidence uh, that uh, that amount of prevalence filter is helpful. Uh, again, the same thing goes for the minimum number of patients. Uh, in our analysis, we have chosen at least 20 patients have to have that code. Uh, you can bring it down to 10 or you can uh, play with this number and do several, several sensitivity analysis to choose this number. The important part is that these numbers, the way we have chosen it, there is no theoretical guideline of like which number is the best, right? And it may depend on the data structure that you are working with. So it is, in my opinion, it is always a good idea to run sensitivity analysis and repeat the analysis multiple times with multiple uh, values of these numbers and try to identify what works best for your analysis in stabilizing the results. In terms of the recurrence covariates, uh, usually um, uh, the three different recurrence covariates are used. Uh, these are the binary covariates based on the recurrence. Um, uh, whether the code happened only once, uh, frequently or sporadically. Uh, and the uh, covariate assessment period in our analysis was 30 days. But in the, if you look at the literature, you will see it can be six months to two years. One, is, one year is more popular and six, uh, six months is most popular uh, in the analysis, in the, in the literature. In terms of the prioritization, um, you can use BROS formula if you are interested in implementing the original high dimensional propensity square algorithm. Uh, but if you want to also use the uh, machine learning versions, you can then, uh, you also have to then declare which type of algorithm you have used. Uh, and then in some algorithms that are complicated, you also need to explain what parameters you have chosen uh, to select the um, proxy variables based on those uh, learners. Selected proxies, in our analysis, we have used 100 proxies. Again, th there is no theoretical justification for this. Um, you should be running a sensitivity analysis to check at, at which point um, the covariates, the inclusion of more covariates um, 
it is uh, changing your OTS ratio estimates, and that will probably dictate you uh, what type of uh, number of proxies are suitable for your analysis. Again, this is a very data dependent decision. Uh, without doing a proper sensory analysis, it is very hard to say how many covariates are going to be useful. And also, uh, you have to also talk about which software you have used with which options and things like that. So all of the analysis that I have done uh, in terms of the original high dimension sensory score algorithm, I have used the auto covariate selection package, which is already available in the CRAN. Uh, but for some of these machine learning methods, you can uh, look at some of the cores that I have provided here that will guide you in implementing some of these machine learning versions of this course. In terms of the diagnostics, again, you have to understand diagnostics and sensitivity analysis are very important in this type of sensitivity analysis. Um, in terms of the standardized mean difference, uh, within 0 0.1 it is something that are, that are regularly used. Uh, we should also report the weight summaries. In our case, the maximum weight was uh, around 54, which is not a lot. Uh, and, and you can determine that based on how many data points you have. So for example, in our case, we had more than 7,000 data. So 54 was not a uh, big number. Uh, but if you are working with only 100 data points and, and you are getting a maximum weight of 54, that is a big number. So it is also a context-dependent decision. Uh, we have to also uh, compare the propensity score distributions be between the exposure groups. So the overlapping or common support uh, is no was not an issue in our case, uh, but you can imagine that when you are using a highly predictive machine learning algorithm, sometimes what can happen is that most of the values could go either close to one and uh, most of the values could also go to either close to zero. And in that case, you would have a overlapping problem. Uh, sorry, non-overlapping problem. Uh, and you have to be very careful in checking this non-overlapping issue before making any reasonable comparison. And um, we have to assess the distribution of the absolute log bias. So I have mentioned that one of the ways we can select uh, the number, the K uh, or the number of uh, proxies is that we can do a sensitivity analysis. One of the other ways would be uh, we can check the distribution of the um, log bias multiplier and try to see um, how, how many numbers are very close to zero and how many numbers are deviating from uh, zero. And that way we can try to determine what could be a reasonable K uh, based on our analysis. And it is always a good idea to compare your high dimension propensity square algorithm analysis with your regular analysis, regular propensity square analysis. Regular propensity score is something that has theoretical justification. Uh, the high dimension propensity score algorithm is basically an ad hoc method, right? So if you want to justify that as a main analysis, you have to clearly state why you think that that is the case. Do you think that in your data source, you um, you have all of the good proxies that are properly supplementing your unmeasured confounder and, and just list your confounders and how do you think uh, this uh, high dimensional propensity score is helping in reducing bias. That is something, that justification should be very clear in that manuscript in my opinion. Okay, in terms of the sensitivity analysis, as I have said, uh, we can run the sensitivity analysis of number of Ks or number of N or the prevalence filters and then we try to understand which type of, uh, which uh, numbers would be suitable for that analysis. Um, in terms of the references for this um, workshop, you can see um, the whole list of references in here. Um, that will probably be helpful for you to familiarize yourself with the literature a bit more. Uh, in the analysis. And at the end of the workshop, you will see there is a description of the enhance. For those who are not familiar with enhance, it might be an interesting idea to just take a look at the enhanced designs because these are publicly available data sources and they have information about a lot of different things. Uh, might be a good under, uh, idea to check out the data and try to see in your own particular context whether you can use this openly available data to contact your analysis. 
that is basically my workshop. Um, so we have reached at the end. I will still be here for another few minutes. If you have any questions, um, I'm happy to answer any question that you present in the chat box. Otherwise, have a uh, great rest of the day. And thank you.